Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Katie and I am your NOAA librarian who's going to be hosting this presentation today. We are very excited to be hosting the second of our mini series for the Weather Program Office on their social science projects that were funded under the FY18 Hurricane Supplemental a few logistical points for everyone. As you are an attendee, you are muted and you cannot um, unmute. So please place all your questions into the question or the chat panel. If you are having any uh, technological issues, as in you can't hear uh, the attendees or me speaking right now, or if you can't see the slides, try logging off and back on. That solves most uh, GoToWebinar issues. And as a reminder, this is being recorded. So if you have to step away or if you would like to share this with a colleague, it will be on the library's YouTube channel after the fact. And I will make sure that that YouTube channel link is in the chat box. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gina, who is going to introduce our speakers today. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us on the second part of a four-part series. Uh, this introduction, for those of you who attended last Wednesday, uh, will be a bit of a repeat. Uh, and those of you who are new this week, welcome. And here is some important background. As many of you know, the Weather Research and Forecast Innovation Act of 2017 requires NOAA to prioritize research that improves forecasts and warnings for the protection of life, property, and the enhancement of the national economy. Specifically, Section 104 of the Weather Act, as well as the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018, otherwise known as the Disaster Supplemental Appropriations, provided NOAA with a really unique and wonderful and important opportunity to integrate the social, behavioral, and economic sciences into NOAA's tropical products, information, services, and importantly, incorporate risk communication excuse me, risk communication research into the design and communication of its products. Uh, the Weather Program Office worked side by side, truly in tandem with the National Weather Service to fund four projects to reach these goals. Today's webinar, um, as earlier stated, is the second of a four part series to highlight this important work. We hope that all of you listening today will join us again at noon on Wednesday, Eastern time, I should say, uh, for the next additional two more weeks um, to hear the third and fourth uh, projects. These projects in today's webinars would not at all be possible without a team, and as such, I would like to continually thank, you can't thank people enough, uh, the NOAA Central Library for hosting these webinars, the National Weather Service, including Jennifer Sprague Hildebrand, Jessica Schauer, Robbie Berg, and all of the members of the Tropical Roadmap team, as well as Mickey Olson and Castle Williams from the Weather Program Office uh, for all of their collective time and commitment to advancing social science R2O. And of course, um, we couldn't do any of these projects without our academic partners involved in these projects. To that end, we are very excited to introduce Dr. Julie DeMuth, Dr. Rebecca Morse, and Robert Presley and their team from the National Center on Atmospheric Research and other partners, as you can see on their title slide, um, whose project was funded under this uh, supplemental funding. This project examines how publics consume and process changing tropical cyclone forecasts over time. It is a very early concept uh, project, and we are very excited to hear some of the early results to date. So, uh, Dr. DeMuth, I'd like to hand it over to you and take it away. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Gina, for that, um, for providing that background. That's really essential. And for your very kind and generous um, welcome. I really want to echo what Gina said. Thank you to everybody for um, inviting us, for having us, and for everything you've done to coordinate the seminar and this research. Um, so Robert Presley and I will be doing most of the speaking today, but Rebecca Morse is the PI on this project and hopefully she'll have a chance to jump in during the Q&A. Um, and as Gina mentioned, we definitely could not do this work without this amazing team of collaborators that we have listed here on our title slide. So thank you so much to all of them. And we are excited to be able to talk about this project where we are investigating how the public accesses, shares, and interprets forecast information as TC threats evolve. I'm gonna try to advance and hope that this works. So there are a couple of key aspects that really help motivate and frame the research that we're presenting today. So there has been a whole host of social science research that has been done in the hurricane context, really valuable research. 
But most of that work has been done cross-sectionally, either asking about hurricanes in general, or so not specific to a, an event, or if they were specific to an event, often they're asking um, afterward and asking pe people retrospectively to think back um, about their experience and report on it. So there's really been very little work um, to systematically assess in near real time how a lot of people who are at risk from tropical cyclones respond to TC risk information. And so to fill this gap, what we wanted to do was try to investigate how the public obtains, interprets, and uses TC risk information, including uncertainty information, again, in near real time, but on top of that, as a threat is evolving. Because of course, the hurricane's evolving, the hazards it poses are evolving, the impacts, all of that. And it stands to reason that as that evolves, we're interested in looking at how do people, how do their attention and their responses evolve as well. And so by information, we're really talking broadly about information generated by NOAA, its partners and other sources provided across a range of channels. And that again, information about the hurricane ha itself, the hazards it poses, impacts, recommended preparedness and response actions. And so with this work we're hoping to do, we also then wanna help NOAA um, develop research guided recommendations to improve TC risk communication, as Gina mentioned. And so we have two approaches that we are going to be talking about today. I'm going to start by talking about um, a longitudinal survey of the public that we did this past summer. And then I'm gonna hand it off to Robert, who's going to be talking about analysis of data um, from Twitter, which is always fun to look at, that they collected and are analyzing um, from a couple of tropical cyclone threats. So I will lead us into the longitudinal survey work. And the motivation for this really mirrors the motivation for the overall project. Again, there has been a lot of work that's been done, mostly cross-sectional using surveys, interviews, and some experimental design that has told us a lot about how people assess and respond to tropical cyclones. And there has been some work that has looked at how people manage evolving TC risks, but again, most of it's done retrospectively looking backward with interviews or in some cases using simulations. So there's still this really big need to understand what are people thinking? What are they doing during an actual TC threat as it's evolving? And the reason there hasn't been much work along these lines is because it's really, really hard to do. So our goals with this project was to try to develop a way to do this. And we wanted to conduct and did conduct a longitudinal panel survey. And by that, I mean, we're surveying the same people multiple times during an actual TC threat with the goal of investigating whether, when, and how people's risk information behaviors their risk perceptions and their responses evolve as that those hurricane risks evolve, including as the risks increase in some areas and then decrease in other areas. But because this is challenging to do, we also made it an explicit goal to really focus on the methodology, to talk about um, and think about how do we develop and demonstrate a method to do this and then potentially refine it based on what we learn so that we can study additional tropical cyclones in the future or other populations from what we've studied here, or maybe even apply this to other hazards. And of course, again, use this knowledge to help NOAA improve their risk communication efforts. And so I've mentioned that this is difficult to do, but I wanted to spend a moment really talking about why. What are the challenges of doing this kind of longitudinal panel survey during a real-time threat? And one of the first challenges is just the lead time we would need to be able to do this. So we have to identify a tropical cyclone that's posing a risk to the US with enough lead time so that we can conduct multiple surveys of the same people. And we call those multiple surveys waves. And we wanna do that during the predictive phase. So of course, while the TC is threatening. Intertwined with this is the challenge of a sample and identifying the people who are in an area that's focused enough that we think they'll be attending to the TC risk or will be in the future. But that's also a large enough geographic area so that we can capture people as that risk actually evolves and will also give us a sufficiently sample size for sufficiently large sample size for data analysis. Another challenge is being able to field the survey wave for long enough so that we can get a sufficient sample size. A lot of times we put surveys in the field for multiple days or weeks, so we can't do that in this context. So we have to figure out though, can we field it for long enough that we can get a good sample size? And then intertwined with that is, can we allow for a long enough interval in between those survey waves for the threat to change, for the information that people are getting um, to change as well and for their responses to potentially change? And then because we're surveying people multiple times, there's always a risk of attrition, losing responses from wave to wave, which we uh, want to try to minimize as much as possible. And so most of those challenges are really logistical, but there's also the challenge of the design. Can we design the survey in a way that we capture these key things that are most interesting and important to us 
um, but that can also capture changes in those variables that occur over a short period of time. And then last but not least, just being able to do this at a reasonable cost level, something that doesn't cost hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so we worked really closely with the survey company and of course with our NOAA partners and developed an approach to do this. And our approach this time around was that we were going to field one longitudinal survey. It was going to be web-based with the existing survey panel and English only just to keep the cost down for this round. And we did this for this past uh, tropical cyclone season, the 2020 hurricane season. And our plan was to survey people three times, again, three waves during that predictive phase of a tropical cyclone, and then also survey them again once more after the storm. And our plan was to survey people from a broad coastal area and continue surveying the same people over and over as the risk evolved. And again, and, and that includes where the TC risk increased, but also in the areas where it decreased so that we could understand how people were paying attention in those areas as well. So we developed our survey, designed it, pre-tested it, and programmed it months in advance. We had to do that so we had it ready to go when there was a threat that we could jump on. And then as far as the predictive survey waves go, our plan was that we knew it was gonna take about 18 to 24 hours to get the survey in the field once we decided to, to, to go to survey a given storm. That we would have each of those waves active in the field for about 24 hours, and that we would have a 24 hour interval in between the waves. And so if you're doing your math, if we have three waves in the field for a day each, a day in between and a day to get going, that means we need six days, about six days of lead time. So that goes back to that lead time challenge I mentioned before. And then our plan was that post-storm survey would be fielded about a week or two after the storm. So with all of this in mind, we designed the survey, again, to focus on a few key constructs that were most important, because of course we couldn't have a survey that was really long if we were going to be asking people to respond to it multiple times. And so the concepts that we really focused on were to try to measure um, what kind of risk information people were accessing, how frequently were they accessing it, what was most important to them. And that includes information from different sources, different channels, and information of different types. And I've circled that because this is a couple of the results I'm gonna talk about in a moment. We also had a big portion of the survey that measured people's risk perceptions. So what they thought the chance of an event or the hazards occurring were, um, the chance of negative impacts, how bad those impacts might be, their worry, negative affective aspects about the threat. And we measured these risk perception questions both about people's thoughts about the, the threat to the US as a whole or to different areas of the US, but also to them personally. We had questions to measure people's self and response efficacy, so their beliefs and their capacity to respond and how effective those responses would be. And then also a number of measures of people's protective responses that they engaged in, including whether or not, whether they did evacuate. And then of course we measured a number of control and moderating variables, other variables that we know are important, including some that we measured on wave one when we wanted to capture this before people experienced the threat, so their past hurricane experiences, measures of their social support during uh, these types of events, questions about COVID, and then we also measured additional things on that post-storm survey that were not as sensitive to their experience, like their home attributes, their residence type, whether they'd done any home proofing, measures of numeracy, worldviews, access to basic needs, and then also on that post-storm wave, we asked questions um, to compare what people thought about the risks that, were, that were, they were going to experience versus then what they actually experienced. So this was our approach and this was our design. And then when it came to making decisions about fielding the survey, we very much used operational forecasts from the Weather Service, particularly from the Hurricane Center. But we also relied on some research project products coming out of the university community and out of NCAR relied on um, listening to the HRD weather briefings, and then we had some weather briefings ourselves. In fact, a shout out to Josh Allen and Dakota Smith, who really led that and helped us monitor the tropics throughout the last summer. But our conversations with our NOAA partners were also really critical in making a decision about whether or not to go and field the survey, because again, we were doing this just one time last summer, and we were all very appreciative of the uncertainty that we were grappling with, um, but their sort of input and guidance was really essential to us making the decision. And so it turned out we got two for the price of one. Uh, when tropical cyclones Laura and Marco were threatening the Gulf Coast, that was the storm, those were the storms that we decided to uh, survey for. And so we decided on August 21st to field our survey for that. Worked with our survey company because of course we did not plan and design our survey to account for two storms. So they let us add a question last minute. They were great so that we could account for that. 
and we went ahead and fielded for those two tropical cyclones. And based on the areas that were being threatened um, on that Friday afternoon, we decided to field the survey in all coastal zip codes that went up to 50 miles inland throughout the entire Gulf Coast. So all the way from Texas through the western half of Florida. So from the tip of the peninsula to the western side of Florida, we fielded all along that area. And we actually had pretty good success with this. So we were able to field three waves during the predictive phase from Marco and Laura. Um, the first wave went into the field early Saturday and was actually in the field for just under 24 hours, about 18 hours. And we got a great sample of close to 1,500 people. And then we only waited about 18 hours and put the second wave in the field from Sunday night to Monday night. And we're getting really good recontact rates, so very little attrition. And then we did have a 24 hour gap between wave two and wave three, and then put wave three in the field from Tuesday evening to Wednesday evening. And again, saw good recontact rates and very little attrition. So you can see that we, um, waves one and two included both the threats from Marco and Laura, but wave three was really more focused on Laura. And then we had our post-storm wave that we put into the field about a week later. Um, so it went to the field and was in the field for about 10 days. And again, saw really good recontact rates. So our final sample size for respondents across all waves is just over 1,000, about 1,033. And here you can see um, this map that shows the zip codes of the locations of the, our final survey sample of respondents where they're located. And so again, you can see they are um, distributed across that entire Gulf, Gulf region. So now as I segue into talking um, about some of the data analysis and results. I want to really discuss about this idea that because we had a sample of people from that entire area, we wanted to be able to do a more refined analysis to compare the responses of people who were in areas that had a greater chance of being affected directly by those TC hazards versus the areas where people had a less chance, especially as the risk areas became more refined in those later survey waves. And so this is what we call tropical cyclone exposure. And the way that we um, categorize this with our sample is through a series, a set of weather service forecast products, but also evacuation orders. And so this graphic here shows what products we relied on to characterize whether or not people were exposed to the TC at each given wave. So whether they were inside the cone of uncertainty, whether they were under a hurricane or tropical storm watch or warning or in a surge watch or warning, if they were in an area where the tropical storm wind speed probabilities were greater than 30%, or if they were under an evacuation order. And a big shout out to Andrea Schumacher, who really did the heavy lifting to curate all of this information and pull it all together. It was not an easy job, especially digging out those evacuation orders. Um, but this has been so essential to our analysis. And we also thank the, our NOAA partners who we talked with about this. And so the way that we designated whether people were exposed or not, given these products, we matched them spatially if they were in a zip code that overlapped at all with any of those products. And we matched them temporally to those products based on a time window of 12 hours before they started the survey through when they completed that survey. And we did this to account for what information they might have been having and, and attending to before they started the survey. And so Andrea has put together some wonderful graphics that show the sort of amalgamation of all of these products so we can see what areas are exposed versus not at each of those three waves. And so this is for wave one. And what you're seeing here in blue and green are the, the cones of uncertainty throughout that wave in the 12 hours prior for Laura and Marco. In red and orange are the hurricane and tropical storm and surge watches or warnings. And in black are those tropical storm wind speed probabilities um, greater than 30%. And so this is that combination of everything during that wave one period. And what we're showing here is in yellow are the zip codes where people are categorized as TC exposed based on these products. And again, based on when they responded to the survey. And black are the, are the zip codes where people were considered not exposed during this wave. And you can see we had an expose, exposure number of about 485, so a little less than half of our sample. So this is wave one, this is wave two, same information. Here we have about 40 some percent of our sample who's exposed and here's wave three. So you can see that risk area really gets refined by the time we get to wave three. And here we have about 35, 36% of our overall sample that's considered exposed. I'm actually just gonna step through that one more time because there's such nice graphics. And so you can see the evolution from wave one, wave two and wave three. And so now I'm just going to show a couple of results. And on the next slide, the results I'm going to show do stratify the responses based on people who are considered TC exposed versus not based on this characterization that I just discussed. 
And so the first set of results I want to show pertains to how frequently people were getting different types, getting information in different ways. And so this is the mean number of times that people got information in the prior 24 hours um, in a handful of different ways. And so what you can see on the y-axis here is that mean number of times that they were getting information. On the x-axis are the three waves, so wave one, wave two, and wave three. And we have the people who were TC exposed based on how I just described in orange and people who were not shown in blue. And so if you look at these five plots, which show five different ways that they were getting information, there's a couple of things that you can pull out right away. First of all, people who are TC exposed are getting information on average more than people who are not considered TC exposed um, in all of these ways and across all of the survey waves. So that's point number one. The other thing that you can notice is that as you step from wave one to wave two to wave three, there's sort of this fanning out. So people who are exposed to the tropical cyclone are getting information more frequently from wave one to wave three, whereas the people who are less exposed are getting it either less frequently or in a more constant, uh, more of a constant rate. And then if we can look at some of the results more specifically, we see that people are getting information, not surprisingly, a lot from their local TV meteorologist or local news station from four or more times for the people who are in the exposed areas. They're getting information from public officials more up to two, more than two times per day by the time you get to wave three for those people who are in the TC exposed areas. People are getting information more from their cell phone as time goes on or by looking outside at the weather, checking on those environmental cues as you go from wave one to wave three in those areas where people are exposed. And then we had an overall measure where we were just asked how actively people are seeking out information. And we see that in the TC exposed, so again, that orange line, people are actively getting information from four up to six times per day by the time you go from wave one to wave three. So these are just some initial simple results that we wanted to show, but they're giving us a nice snapshot of what people are doing in real time during these threats from Marco and Laura. And so similarly, I wanted to show some results about the importance, the mean importance of different kinds of forecast information. And so here we just measured this on a one to five scale from not at all important to extremely important. So that's your y-axis. Otherwise, everything here is the same uh, compared to the plots that we did, I showed on the previous slide. And so again, you see the similar pattern where people who are TC exposed are, they think that the information is more important overall than the people who aren't exposed. And again, you see this fanning out where in many cases the information becomes more important as we go from wave one to wave three for those people and less important or kind of in a flat way for the people who aren't exposed. And then when we look specifically at the types of information we measure, we see how important it is that people want um, to know about the potential track from the cone of uncertainty, about those wind speeds, about the timing of storm arrival. So ranking on average four, between four and five on a scale of one to five. And then when we asked about different types of flooding, storm surge or coastal flooding and rainfall flooding, we see that they're also important, rainfall and flooding for the people who are in the exposed areas a little bit more compared to the storm surge or coastal flooding. Although, again, this is characterizing people who are exposed in multiple ways. And so for that, we might in particular look at just the people who are in storm surge watches and warnings and see how they thought about the importance of that kind of information. So that's something we can look at in the future. And then just one more result, and then I'll hand it off to Robert. We wanted to look at people's perceptions of whether or not they were in the cone of uncertainty. So now I'm not taking that overall characterization of TC exposed or not. Here, we're just looking at whether or not people were in the cone versus what they thought. And a majority of people, 80% of respondents in all of the waves were correct about whether or not they were in the cone. So that's a good thing. But then we wanted to look at that other 20% of people who were incorrect. And that's what I'm showing here. In orange, I'm showing the people who thought that they were not in the cone, but actually were. And in blue, I'm showing the people who thought that they were in the cone, who, but who actually weren't. And, one of, and the other thing to keep in mind is that the number of people who are actually in the cone decreases quite a bit from wave one to wave three. And a key thing to note here is that in those earlier waves, waves one and wave two, there are people who are in the cone, but don't actually know that they are. And we're not sure why this is the case. It could have had something to do with the fact that was, there was both Marco and Laura going on. We want to look into this a little bit more. But by the time you get to wave three, almost everybody who's inside the cone knows that they are. And then also as you get to wave three, you have more people who think that they're in the cone, but who aren't actually. And this is something we'll, we'll look into a little bit more. So again, these are just a couple of results to really whet appetites. Um, we're going to be doing more analysis of the data 
along these lines, but also more sophisticated analysis with some multi-level modeling, including what we call growth modeling, so that we really can look at how people are changing, what information they're getting, what they think is important, their risk perceptions over time and at what rates. And then also what we call survival analysis or event occurrence, where we can look at whether and when people are taking those protective responses. And then when we do this analysis, also look at some of these other um, variables that we measure to see to what extent they uh, have effects on these, on these um, outcomes, including maybe their socio demos, their past experiences, worldviews, numeracy, et cetera. And then of course, we'll be comparing responses from those predictive waves with what happened, what people reported after the tropical cyclones, Marco and Laura. And then we definitely are eager to think about what these results mean jointly with NOAA and what it might mean for improving risk communication. And then in the future, in addition to this analysis, we will be fielding the, longitude, the same longitudinal survey for two more tropical cyclones in 2021 so that we can try to capture um, how people respond for different types of TC threats because not all hurricanes pose the same kinds of hazards. So maybe we'll look at something where there's a heavy rainfall threat more so, or maybe where a storm is weakening as it's forecast to weaken as it approaches landfall. But just so that we can kind of capture that range of the hazards that are posed by these different tropical cyclones and really help strengthen the generalizability of our results. And in doing so, we're also hoping to refine this method so that maybe we can think about operationalizing something like this on a more regular basis. You can imagine if we could similarly uh, observe people the way for every tropical cyclone, the way that we do with satellites, radar, buoys, all of it, how wonderful that would be. So this is kind of our pipe dream. And with that, I'm gonna pause now and I'm gonna hand it over to Robert so that he can talk about Twitter data and then we'll take questions at the end. So Robert, you are- You can up. hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Julie. Um, I'm going to go ahead and talk about our Twitter data analysis. And so in much the same way that um, Julie's analysis was motivated by sort of lacks um, that we find in, in the literature, ours is also. We know that visualizations of forecast information are a really key way to communicate and disseminate forecast info. But we do not have a lot of studies of authoritative source Twitter content during disasters that's predominantly focused on the role of images. In fact, most of the stuff that's out there, most of the studies out there focus on the role of tweet text solely. One such analysis that does look at image content is one by one of our colleagues, Melissa Bika, who looked at a whole set of risk images during the 2017 hurricane season. And so our analysis really builds off of that analysis to investigate how the dissemination and diffusion of hurricane risk images varies throughout the evolution of various tropical cyclones. Really, in particular, we're interested in assessing how at-risk users are interacting with evolving tropical cyclone forecast information provided by a range of authoritative sources within the context of the broader informational environment. Um, our outcomes for this project are hopefully to develop knowledge that can inform Twitter usage by authoritative sources, such as NOAA and the Weather Service, during evolving threats, um, while also developing methods for studying future storms. You can move to the next slide. So if you just want to click through to the end of this one, Julie, I'll just get everything on the page it was. Uh, one more. Great, thank you. Um, so we, uh, the key methodological component of our data um, collection here is that we collected a whole set of tweets. We started with about 116,000 tweets, and then we engaged in a multi-step filtering process in order to really uh, key in on the types of content that we think are going to be most relevant for um, for users who are at risk of um, the storm. Uh, in particular here, we're looking at Hurricane Harvey. So the first step was to filter to only include tweets that were posted when Harvey was an active threat. The next step was to filter to only include tweets from a select number of sources. So we included sources that were local to the areas affected, primarily in Texas and Louisiana, um, and also a few national sources as well, although we were a little bit more picky about which ones to include there. Um, the next step was to filter to only include tweets that included risk imagery related to hurricanes. And then finally, the last two steps were to code to only include tweets with images that were relevant to Harvey and that included forecast information about Harvey. And so that yields our uh, final forecast filter data set of about 3,400 tweets from 98 different sources. We can move to the next slide. Um, Julie, as I move through these, you can just, as I mentioned, uh, a group, you can just click forward to the next one. Um, so we did code for a number of variables when looking at uh, the sources of Twitter information, of authoritative source information, um, and then we sort of categorized them into these seven primary groups. 
Um, the first group that we looked at was local uh, weather service that includes um, WFOs, such as NWS Houston. Um, we also looked at broadcast meteorologists and weather accounts at the local level. We looked at uh, local non-weather service government accounts, which includes emergency management and local city governments, among others. Um, we include local news media, which includes um, TV stations and newspapers, as well as we had sort of um, these weather bloggers, as we call them, which were um, locally important um, in Harvey. At the national level, we were a bit more selective. So we include national weather service accounts, such as the Hurricane Center, um, other national centers and official accounts, and also, again, national weather media. You can go to the next slide. Uh, same deal with this one, Julie. <laughs> Um, so the other aspect of our coding was to code the images. And so we were looking at really um, a broad set of iconic risk image representations, many of which originate from the Weather Service or NOAA. So we include, um, uh, we include images such as key message graphics um, and uh, tropical outlooks that originate from the Hurricane Center. We also include the cone of uncertainty. Um, and you can click the next one, Julie, as well. Um, and so one other aspect that we did in terms of image coding was we coded the branding, as we call it, of these images. So you can see the cone example here. Um, you can see the, the Weather Service and NOAA logos. So that would be an NWS branded image. This other cone example comes from the Weather Channel, which does not include the Weather Service branding. And so it would be non-Weather Service branded. Um, and if you click through the next two, um, these are uh, a similar sort of example of weather service branded and non-weather service branded um, examples of model output, which includes um, spaghetti plots. Um, in addition to those sorts of more tropical oriented uh, image types, we also had a number of rainfall um, outlooks and forecasts, which were included, as well as river flood forecasts. Again, those were quite uh, common when we were looking at Harvey, given the rainfall threat. We also had a number of images that solely included forecast information textually. And so we did separate those out into their own category because there were enough of them in our data set. And then we also had convective outlooks and forecasts, most of which come from the Storm Prediction Center. Finally, the last group that we have are uh, watch warning images. These were really very common. And specifically, we decided to split out these what we call experimental watch warning images, which originate from um, the Weather Service, uh, specifically a couple of accounts at the national level which posts these for basically every um, watch warning that is issued in the United States. And so you can move to the next slide now. So the first thing that we wanted to do was just look at a broad level at um, how diffusion varies by these different source and image categories. And so we'll start with sources. And so you can see here, this is all of our source categories. You will note again that we split out those watch warning images for local and national weather service because you can see here that they have very low diffusion compared to other um, source categories. And so given that we wanted to remove them because they're also very frequent and we didn't want them to sort of um, hide the true trends in diffusion for national and local weather service accounts. And so the way that this graph is oriented here, all of the bars here that are the same color are source groupings that sort of group together. They are all statistically significantly different from all of the other source groupings, but they are uh, statistically, they're not statistically different from each other. And so you can see there's kind of a tiering, uh, a hierarchy of different sources here where National Weather Service, Local Weather Service, National Weather Media, and Local Weather Bloggers are sort of at the top tier here in terms of diffusion overall across um, the entire storm period. Local non-weather service government is sort of in a middle tier. And then local weather media, local news media are sort of in a lower tier, along with local what that those watch warning accounts, as I mentioned previously. Move to the next slide. So here's the same sort of analysis looking at our image types. And you can see we really don't see the same level of clustering that we did with sources. We don't really see the same sort of tiering. We have a lot of uh, very similar sort of uh, diffusion for many of these image types. The exceptions here would be key message graphics, which are sort of in their own stratosphere when it comes to media and um, retweet diffusion. Um, that could be in part because many of these are posted by the Hurricane Center, which is an account with a very large reach. The other um, image type that has very high diffusion would be rainfall outlooks and forecasts. And then, as I mentioned, those experimental watch warnings are sort of bringing up um, the bottom tier here with much lower diffusion than other image types. Okay, so you can move to the next slide. So here's sort of taking um, a more detailed look at our data set. Um, so what this graph shows, each dot, each circle on here represents one tweet in our data set. The size of the circle represents how many retweets the tweet received. 
And the coloring here represents whether it was an NWS branded or non weather service branded um, image. And then each row here corresponds to our image types. And so you can go across the row here and that's going through time from August 17th when the storm initiated in the Caribbean through September 2nd when it dissipated. Um, Julie, if you could uh, click the next thing. So we'll just take it through three different time bins here. The first here begins again when Harvey was initiated over the Caribbean um, up until the time when it regenerated in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. And so you can see there's not a lot of content during this time period. There are a few cone images when Harvey was over the Caribbean, but then the storm dissipated, so the cones go away. They are replaced as, with model output and tropical outlook um, graphics, which during this time period are predominantly non-weather service branded. Um, and this was during a time period when it looked like there could be potential for redevelopment, but there had not been official guidance to say so yet. Um, and so this is sort of an opportunity um, where there is sort of a lack of information, um, especially from uh, weather service um, accounts. If we move into the next time bin, here we're looking at basically the forecast phase of the storm, starting from when Harvey regenerated in the Gulf of Mexico up until the time when it made landfall. And you can see that there's really a, a huge explosion of content during this time period, but especially so for cone images, for key message graphics, and for rainfall outlooks and forecasts. Another thing that's interesting to note here is that while a lot of the content gets started around August 23rd, we don't really see the diffusion jump in a big way until August 24th. This is the time period when it was clear that Harvey was going to make landfall as a major hurricane. And so this is when I think public attention broadly begins to peak um, and it continues as the storm progresses up until the point where it makes landfall. Um, Julie, you can move to the next time period here. And so this is really sort of the warning phase, uh, transitioning into the post storm phase. And so we can see for most of these image types, they continue to be posted pretty prolifically, at least for a few days um, after the storm makes landfall. Again, attributing to the fact that Harvey was a pretty unusual threat and that we continue to see massive impacts days after landfall. Um, but we do then see a, a general trend towards less content and less diffusion over time. The other thing to note about this time period is that we see a lot of these watch warning graphics. Again, the experimental watch warning graphics, the um, watch warning graphics in general, you can see how densely packed they are in the area, especially in the days after landfall, as um, Harvey really transitions to a flash flooding threat. And we also saw a number of tornado warnings issued during this time period. Similarly, we see convective outlooks and forecasts, which are posted regularly. But again, they did not have a lot of diffusion, similar to many of the watch warning graphics. Again, this could simply be because this doesn't match really with the dominant threat at the time. We can contrast that with river flood forecasts, which also begin to pick up during this time period. Um, and they are more uh, moderately to highly diffused at times, even though they are also predominantly weather service branded images. So again, it really seems to suggest that um, the, the, the products that speak more to the dominant threat at the time seem to do better diffusion wise. So you can move to the next slide. Right, so given um, sort of looking at the data broadly, uh, we decided to look in more detail qualitatively at a few different time bins spaced out throughout the storm's evolution. Um, and so we chose to look at three different time bins on August 23rd, August 24th, and August 27th. You can see from the chart on the right here that these correspond to local peaks in diffusion, uh, retweets, uh, total retweets, and also tweet count um, at three different times during the storm's evolution. Um, and we also chose to look at the same time period for each of those days from 9 to 12 a.m. local time. This corresponds um, broadly to when the Hurricane Center is releasing information, but also we wanted to look at sort of the same time frame, just so we could rule out, as you can see, there are some diurnal effects day to day. And so we were able to, by looking at these three time bins, we, we were able to rule that out as sort of a causative effect, thinking about what is impacting diffusion and tweet content over time. Okay, so Julie, you can move to the next slide. So let's just jump right in here and look at the August 23rd time bin. You can see sort of the same sort of plot uh, as before, but here we're looking at that uh, 9 to 12 a.m. Um, time bin on August 23rd. And the other difference here is that the color coding for these tweets is a little bit different. The green tweets here correspond to tweets that come from local sources. The uh, orangish, pinkish are coming from national sources. Um, so Julie, if you could click through here. So the first thing that we note uh, in terms of tweet content is that we really do see a lot of proliferation of these cone images right around the time when the Hurricane Center is releasing information. And so that sort of points to the fact that the, the Hurricane Center release of information, especially the new cone that now shows um, Houston or Harvey 
uh, regenerating and potentially impacting land is really a driver for other authoritative sources to chime in and to provide their own sort of contextualizations of that information. You can click to the next one here. We also see sort of a, a little mini peak for watch warning information that occurs between about 1030 and 11. Um, and so again, not surprising given that there were new watch warnings that were issued um, for parts of the Texas coast. I'm going to click through here, um, Julie. One thing to note is that we don't have a lot of rainfall outlooks and forecasts during this time period, despite the fact that the flooding threat was pretty imminent at this point. Um, but we do see that many originators are alluding to the flooding threat within the tweet text uh, of other types of images. When we look at the diffusion patterns, one thing that really sticks out here is that many of the most diffused images in this time period come from our national sources. This really does seem to be sort of the primary driver of diffusion, at least during this time period. Um, Julie, if you could click through here. So here's an example from the Weather Channel. Um, you can see that uh, even compared to other uh, images that presumably are showing very similar types of information, this Weather Channel tweet has quite a bit more diffusion than other tweets posted around that time period. And then finally, the last thing that I wanted to sort of note here is we can look within sort of image types that occur frequently, such as cones, and you can see that there's a huge range of diffusion between the lowest uh, diffusion tweets and the highest diffusion tweets. Um, and so that would seem to suggest that image type by itself is not really driving diffusion, at least not in the same way as source. You can see this example here that only has two retweets, despite showing pretty much the same information as this previous one, which has over 100 retweets. There are other factors that could explain it, but it does, it does suggest that image type by itself is not um, super predictive of what um, gets diffused on Twitter, at least during this time period. And we can move to the next slide here. So here is sort of the same analysis looking at the time bin on August 24th. Again, Julie, if you could uh, click through here, you could see basically the same sort of uh, bullseye here, even more exaggerated during this time bin, where we have a lot of cone images that are posted immediately in the time, maybe in the, in the 10 to 30 minutes after the Hurricane Center releases new updated cone information. Um, and again, especially some very high diffu highly diffused tweets during this time period, especially from those national sources. Um, so here's an example from the Weather Channel. You can note in their tweet text, and this was pretty consistent across many of our authoritative sources during this time bid, is that a lot of the focus is on the potential for Harvey to reach Category 3 before landfall. Um, this was really sort of a jump in forecast intensity, and so that was what was sort of grabbing the headlines, so to speak. Again, we do see that there are a few rainfall outlooks and forecasts posted during this time period including this more highly diffused one from the Hurricane Center, but they are still fewer and further between than um, the highly diffused cone images that we see, which are more focused on storm intensity. So moving to the next time bin um, on August 27th, this is a really a radically different sort of set of circumstances in terms of tweet content and diffusion. Um, again, as we've moved into a very different phase of the storm's um, trajectory. So one thing we see is that um, we don't see those sort of the, the, the flurry of cone activity that occurs after the, the Hurricane Center releases the new cone at 10 a.m. It's just simply not as relevant during this time period. Where we do see sort of these um, flurries of activity, it's in coordination with is the issuance of particular watch warnings. So for instance, there are these two sort of very prominent watch warnings that are issued um, during this time period. The first here is uh, a tornado warning that's issued for southern parts of the Houston metro area. A lot of the discussion on Twitter at that point in time was related to the overlap of the tornado warning with existing flash flood warnings. This second little bubble here corresponds to the, um, Julie, if you could click through, thanks. Yep, the second bubble corresponds to the, um, the reissuance of a flash flood emergency for much of the Houston area. And so we see that these, uh, watch warnings and the discussion around them are they are more so driving the conversation during these time periods. Um, the other thing to note here is that our local sources are seeing just about very similar diffusion to the national sources during this time period. And so that sort of leads into a sort of a final point from our qualitative analysis, if you move to the next slide here, is that we do really see that, especially for weather service sources, there's sort of a changing of the roles of who is providing information and who is facilitating. So we see that in sort of the pre-landfall phase, the Hurricane Center is providing information, releasing information, driving a lot of the conversation on Twitter. And local NWS WFOs, for instance, are referring back to the Hurricane Center, repackaging that information for their local area. Whereas when we enter sort of that warning post-landfall phase, we see that it reverses. We see the, 
the, the, the local WFOs are providing the information and driving the conversation, whereas the Hurricane Center is now acting in more of a facilitatory role. So if you can move to the next slide. Based on sort of our quantitative and qualitative results, we do have a few key findings. The first is that authoritative sources generally are pretty effective in communicating and emphasizing the primary hazards as the threat evolves. We see that as the threat evolves from a, 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 a storm surge and heavy, high wind threat, we see to a, a rainfall flooding and river flooding threat, we see that the, the, the number and diffusion of um, particular image types sort of evolves to follow that. There are a few exceptions, which I'll note. Um, first is that there is a, a sort of a lack of content, especially weather service branded content before official guidance is released. Um, we do see a lot of these tornado warnings that are issued, especially by these sort of experimental weather service accounts when flooding is really the dominant threat. And we do see a number of originators sort of emphasizing storm intensity pre landfall. But still, we see especially weather service accounts still emphasizing the flooding threat early and often, um, and in general, again, pretty effective in communicating and emphasizing the primary hazards. The other big key finding here is that tweet diffusion really seems to be primarily driven by the tweet source who is providing the information on Twitter with image type and content playing a lesser role. That's not to say that it's not entirely important, but um, that tweet source is sort of serving as the baseline of what diffusion is possible. And so then it's good to see that the weather service and no accounts are really key authoritative sources that uh, they not only generate high diffusion on their own posts, but they're also driving conversation and public attention. And in doing so, it sort of funnels attention down to uh, more local accounts and other authoritative sources who can then provide that information to their followers. Next slide, please. So based on our results and based on our process of working with this data, we do have a few recommendations and next steps. Um, we recommend continued Twitter analyses to help NOAA understand and improve its use of social media. We also recommend, based on our results here, that stronger coordination across NOAA and with other authoritative sources would be good to ensure optimal communication strategies, to ensure that the, the, the right hazards are being emphasized at the right times and that um, language is consistent across the weather enterprise. And finally, we would recommend to explore development of more quick response Twitter analyses shortly after a storm or in real time, in the same way that Julie's analysis shows how we can engage with these analyses and, and develop understanding in real time. It would be great to have similar analyses for Twitter data so that we can provide recommendations that uh, NWS and NOAA can act on um, more quickly. In terms of next steps, we are working on a number of other Twitter analyses with additional storms. As I mentioned, Harvey was somewhat of an atypical case in that it had a very short lead time and we had a lot of this sort of warning content um, after the storm's landfall. So we're looking at other storms like Irma and Michael, which have different lead times, and we're coming at those storms with sort of different, um, different theoretical constructs and, and different selection schemes in order to build complementary analyses that um, engage with different perspectives. And finally, sort of a question that I'll sort of leave it with is we are thinking more about understanding diffusion at a deeper level. We see in this data set that there are a lot, there's lots of useful content that is posted on Twitter that does not gain a lot of retweet diffusion. And we see there's a lot of um, maybe not, not useless information, but information that is diffused for reasons beyond just the forecast content, for instance, capitalizing on a meme or um, generating political controversy. And so we are sort of thinking about good and bad diffusion, and whether it matters who is retweeting um, our, our, these weather service images and, and whether, um, whether it matters um, who, how people uh, engage or reach, with, reach the information. Um, so with that, that will conclude our discussion here of the Twitter analysis. Again, a huge thank you to our NOAA collaborators um, and to our other collaborators at NCAR, at CU Boulder, and elsewhere who have made this research possible. Great, thank you so much. This was an awesome presentation. We do have um, questions and questions still coming in, but I'm gonna turn it over to Robbie Berg, who is going to kick us off with his question. Hey, thank you. Uh, and thanks, Julie and Robert, for the uh, excellent presentation. Uh, Julie, we were, uh, some of us at NHC were talking behind the scenes. We were actually shocked that you're finding that 80% of people uh, correctly identified if they were in or out of the cone. Um, and we know that the cone is not a hazard, it's just uh, where the center of the storm might go. But we we're wondering if you think that a result like that indicates that when we're looking at potentially changing the cone, should we look, be looking at more like a bulk risk type of product, uh, 
taking advantage of the fact that so many people seem to be able to correctly identify if they're in that area or outside that area? Yeah, that's an interesting question, Robbie. Um, I think one thing we want to do too, and I think Andrea Schumacher has this queued up, is do that same kind of analysis for the other products because we asked in our survey, and I have to pull it up, you know, whether they thought they were in the cone, whether they were in an evacuation order. Um, gosh, we have a couple of other questions that are measuring their perception of these different hazards, and we want to be able to compare those with what their the reality was. So I think the first thing we should do is take a look at all those other parts of the survey questions too and compare with the reality. Um, I, I, <laughs> I mean, your question is so big <laughs> that I think um, really a lot of the analysis we're doing should be pointing, well, should, should help guide the answer to that question, whether or not we should have a product that really discusses multiple hazards kind of um, all together, maybe a lot like those graphics that Andrea put together. Um, but I, I don't know that we can necessarily answer that cleanly just by looking at the whether people are in the cone or out, but it's something that will hopefully fall out of all of the analyses that we're doing. Um, so it's not really a direct answer, but it's something that I, I'm hoping that we can get to, to point to by the end of, of this project. I don't know if, Rebecca, you have anything else you want to add? No, I think um, that's a great answer. And really, we're looking well, as we get more results and combine the two kinds of results together, we hope to be able to provide more detailed answers to be able to guide those kinds of decisions going forward. But I will say that, I mean, even these, these simple results, like so many people know that they're in the cone is something we just didn't know before. And so it's important to also study this with a few additional storms and with different samples to make sure that, you know, the results are, are applicable across several cases. Awesome, thanks Robbie uh, for that question. I'm gonna try and get through as many of these questions before we um, end at one. So our first question is, how did you reach out to the public to sign up for participation in the survey and were there any incentives to participate? Yes, that's a great question. So we worked with a survey company called YouGov and we worked with their panel. This was something that we decided we had to do to make it feasible to field um, kind of in this rapid way that we knew that we were going to have to. So how they do their recruiting to develop the panel is, is how we um, got the, the sample that we did. And people were, did, they were offered incentives. And that was actually something that we developed flexibility into our incentive structure in case we had to offer higher incentives so that they could, so that they would be willing to respond to subsequent waves. In fact, I think we were willing to offer quite a bit more by wave three and, and even the post storm wave. But in fact, we didn't have to. The lower incentives were sufficient for them to respond. So we don't know. This was one of my hypotheses that people are interested in being able to share the experiences when they're actually being threatened by a hurricane. Um, whether or not that's truly the case um, is we, we don't really know. But but we did offer incentives, but we didn't actually have to offer as high of incentives as even we intended to to get people to respond. Great, thanks. And will uh, 2021 use the same uh, participants or the same uh, layout? So this is something that we're evaluating. Um, we are hoping because we were able to get pretty good samples in shorter periods of time that we maybe don't have to do the same 24 hours in the field, 24 hour interval. This is, we need to talk with the survey company about this because it would be nice if we could actually field something um, when we didn't have five, six days of lead time, but for storms that maybe form and, and you know, we'll be making landfall within three or four days. So we're looking at refining that a little bit. We will not be fielding it with the exact same participants that we did for the 2020 survey, but we will be again using YouGov and their panel um, for the storms that we will be fielding for in 2021. I can't remember if there was another question there that I forgot to respond um, to. Just to add something briefly about the sampling, we wanted to use a sample from a company rather than just publicizing something, say, on social media and elsewhere, so that we would get people who weren't necessarily weather engaged. And so that was kind of our interest. And we had no idea if it would work. There was a huge amount of coordination on the back end to try to get this to happen. And we initially talked to several survey companies, and we went with the one, only one that told us they could actually make this happen. And so now that we've done it once, we can 
refine it, but um, we probably did get people that are more weather engaged than average because they were interested in responding to the survey. But these are just people who answer surveys on all kinds of questions. They're not people that you know saw a notice from the weather service or something. So that was was part of our goal with that, and that's why we offered incentives and structured it the way that we did. Great, thanks. Our next question. Um, do you, did you ask if getting back into a neighborhood is a factor for people who consider or not evacuating? No, that's a great question. This question of re-entry post-evacuation. Um, so we did not. That's something we could consider in the future. I think it would be um, one thing we're trying to decide is whether or not we want to keep the survey exactly the same because we and, and that's part of the analysis that we're doing right now look to see what kind of variants we got and if there's any ways that we could shorten the survey so that we have space to add in other questions um, but we didn't think about having a re-entry type of question but that's something that we could consider doing so we we do know from other research that's a consideration for people we don't know how much it's a consideration compared to other kinds of things one thing about this sample is we don't, and because of we start so far in advance, more than five days making a decision about where to field, we don't end up getting that many people that actually evacuate. So um, just because of how we have to do it, that was not one of our goals, but um, we, we could ask that question, but it just depends on how, in, in this case, we didn't even know whether the storm was gonna impact the area. So we focused more on questions where we knew we would have useful information, no matter whether the storm dissipated or how many people we ended up you know, getting that actually experienced a major impact and did evacuate. Great, thanks. Our next question is for Robert. Do you envision the Twitter analysis being able to provide uh, the National Hurricane Center and National Weather Service with better information on a timeline for putting out information or graphics that may be better suited for diffusion? For example, finding a better time to release information to encourage diffusion. Um, yeah, I, I think we see a little bit of that um, here. Um, I, one thing that I, I kind of was thinking as we went through this is um, the Hurricane Center releases new information at 10 a.m., uh, at least central time. And then we don't see the key message graphics come out until about 30 minutes later. And I think what's clear from these analyses is that these sort of windows where a lot of people are talking about the new information are relatively short. They last maybe on the order of 10 to 30 minutes. And so that would be one avenue where we could do that. And then I think also one of our recommendations here was to think about um, being able to deploy uh, in the same way that Julie did with her with those surveys to be able to deploy Twitter analyses in real time. And that I think would be very useful and able to be able to say um, this type of content isn't working right now. This isn't matching with what people are talking about. Um, and now we would be able to provide really, I think, tailored recommendations. Um, again, it's it's sort of a, a pipe dream, but um, it's something that we would love to be able to do. Great, thanks. Uh, do you think Google Maps, where people can view warnings and other notifications on a map so they can see whether they are in the cone, would be a way to improve this going forward? Um, is this in relation to Nope, sorry, this is a brand new question. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, so I'll just I... go ahead. I was going to say in the interest of time, I'll just answer it at a broad level that we we do see examples in our, some of our other analyses of people doing these kinds of things like um, putting themselves on a map and saying, is this going to affect me? I think that um, more specific information can be helpful, but also the results from that Julie showed indicate that a lot of people can assess whether they're in the cone at that broad level. So it's definitely something that we can look into in more detail. And these are the kind of questions we like to inform about what is the most effective way to be able to communicate information to different kinds of audiences. It's a great question to think about. Great, I'm gonna grab a couple more. Will there be an analysis of how the graphics linked to the key messages or tweets so we can understand some aspects of diffusion? Yeah, um, we, I think we thought about looking at that briefly, but we decided that key messages sort of by itself was sort of an iconic image type. And so we wanted to think about that. The other tough thing with key messages is that we don't have a lot of them in our data set um, just because they're only posted every few hours. So we are hopeful that maybe with Irma, because it was such a longer um, fuse event where we had many, many days of lead time before it made landfall, 
we might be able to look at things like that in more detail in terms of like what types of images are included in the key messages, what types of content are included. Great, last question. Based on your results so far, what is the most important thing the National Weather Service can do today to better reach people at risk from tropical cyclone hazards? Uh, yeah, I'll, Rebecca, do you have any thoughts there? That's such a huge question, but. <laughs> yeah, that's a really big question. Um, I think, let's see, I, I would say the biggest thing is to not make assumptions about what people are doing, but to really understand it and to, um, so I think there are people have concerns when they communicate information that people don't understand it, but really to listen and see what's happening. And I think that Another thing that our research across the board suggests is that people on the ground, like the broadcast meteorologists and the emergency managers, have a good sense of what where there might where there is miscommunication potentially or where there's an information gap. And so to really coordinate with those partners as far as which messages that are going out people are getting, are there things they're misunderstanding? Um, really this idea that everyone's working together to communicate um, and that these other groups, even like the weather bloggers and the local media are really playing an important role in communicating. And so how can the weather service kind of feed messages that are important, not only with their own diffusion, but with other groups helping them diffuse. And then other groups like local sources are hearing back from people, all of these questions, like we didn't show this, but their questions like, what about me? What about this? What about that? Um, like early in our Michael analysis, it suggests that um, people are asking about the inland wind threat. And so that would be a way to be able to identify that in real time and say this is a gap that we could fill. So maybe that was not that was kind of a long answer, but those are that's a great question for us to think about. Thank you. Great, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, we are over time, so I want to respect everyone's time and in this for everyone. But last question, I do want to ask this: um, Are was it is it possible to get a copy of these slides afterwards and share them with the attendees today? Yes, that would be yeah. fine. And we definitely welcome additional questions as we think we're in the process of doing the research and you can see these are early results that we're interpreting. So we definitely look forward to more conversations. Great, so much. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, since we do have a few questions that we did not get to, I will send them on to the speakers after the fact. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Please have a safe and uh, good rest of your Wednesday. Thank you to our speakers and to the Weather Program Office for sponsoring this.